Hi, welcome again. My name is Jamie Loizu, and this is week three of a six-week course called Christianity 101. We want to welcome you again, and um, thanks for being here. What I want to do, well, let's uh, remind you again to click on the attendance link, make sure we can see who's here, who's not, and also there are four ways, just as a way to remind her, I do this every week, four ways of reaching us. First, on the email, on the um, webpage. It says, you see a tab on the bottom that says ask question. That's probably the most popular way and the easiest way to contact us. Just type out your question. We, we'll receive it here. A second way of reaching us is email, and that is christianity101 at mclanebible.net. I think you've got that written down there. You've received that before. Third way, you can tweet us. We actually got a tweet, I think, last week. Uh, hashtag, where is it? Uh, hashtag christianity101. And then finally, if you want to text us, the phone number would be 703. 594-6392. Like I mentioned before, go ahead and send us your questions uh, during the broadcast as well. If it's something germane to what we're talking about, we'll do our best to answer it at that time. If not, we can field questions at the end of the course and, uh, of course, during the week as well. All righty. Let's do this. We've, uh, this is the third week. We've had two classes already, as I mentioned. Let me give you a brief overview. Uh, we have three or four new students tonight, so welcome. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I will spend a few um, minutes on each. Week one, we talked about the veracity and the trustworthiness of the Bible. Obviously, the point of that is that the Bible is the basis, the foundation of our faith in Christ. And um, we, we talked about, um, oh, about the Bible. If you have questions about the reliability, the veracity of the Bible, there's some other sources that you can get, supplemental material. Go to the website, McLean Bible, and specifically I want to refer to you, Lon Sermons on the Reliability of the Bible, Parts 1 and 2. It'd be awesome, well worth your time if you've got any questions at all, and if you want to firm up your, your understanding of that. Um, also, week one, the second part of that week was, uh, can I have a personal relationship with God? And what was our answer? Yes, absolutely, of course. God has seen to this. He is not a hide-and-seek God. He's making himself totally clear to us, um, and he's reaching out to us. In two ways we talked about general revelation, which would be the creation. Nature itself speaks about you know, who God is. And the second part would be specific revelation, which would be the Bible, the Word of God itself. Now there's another part. We talked about a uh, relationship. There's always two ways. God is there waiting and wanting to, to touch us and to love us and to reach us. We have to respond. We have to take that first step to do it. Um, we, so we have to be willing to do that. This is a supernatural transaction. I want to really encourage you. I did this last week as well. Pray. Pray. Lord, show me. Reveal yourself in your word. Reveal yourself to me. And I'm, I want to learn. Um, I've got an example here of someone in, who you've heard of, another example of just what I'm trying to say. It's about perception. It's about reaching out, understanding who God is. This is James B. Irwin. You've heard of him. He's an astronaut, Apollo 15 mission. He actually walked on the moon. And uh, this is an autograph book. It says, to Jamie, wish I, I could be more like you, your BFF. No, <laughs> he did not say that. But what he did say is there's a small chapter in here about does God exist. And... Um, I'll just read a little bit to you because I think it's uh, pertinent. When the first Russian cosmonaut, Yuri Gagarin, returned to Earth, he traveled widely and told everyone, I did not see God up there. The second Russian in space, Titov, also boasted that he was an eagle and he could not see God anywhere. Well, in 1975, um, Colonel uh, Irwin, Colonel, yeah, Colonel Irwin was in Egypt. He was the first American astronaut to visit the country, and everyone there asked him the same question. Did you see God? What about God? Tell me about God. His response was totally opposite. It was something more along the lines of uh, the heavens declare his glory. He wrote here in the book, When on the moon I was so inspired by the presence of the Lord that I quoted Psalm 121.1, which says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. And on Christmas Eve of 1968, when Apollo 8 circled the moon and was on the backside of the moon, we heard them read the Genesis account of creation. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The listening earth sat spellbound as we were reminded of God's goodness to the men in the blue planet. The point, why did I say this? Because Erwin uh, also says here, I believed about the differences. They both are brilliant men. They're, they're courageous. <clears throat> they were, saw the same thing in space. Of course, Erwin walked on the moon. Gagarin didn't, but he said, what's the difference there? 
He says, I believe we see what our hearts let us see. What the scriptures say is, Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And that's what I'm trying to say. When you're trying to understand God, be sure to pray first and have ears to hear and eyes to see. A um, little tangent there, but that's <coughs> what I want to emphasize about week one. Week two, who is Jesus and why is he unique? We talked about that. He's unique because he declared himself to be God. He claimed to be God. And all of his contemporaries and people heard that claim. In fact, they, as you know, they tried to, um, that's why they crucified him. His claim to be God, the blasphemy there. Um, and so his claims of deity were understood, proofs of miracles, we went through all this last week, prophecy fulfilled, testimony of contemporaries, and changed lives. That left us with a choice. If you remember last week, C.S. Lewis, the paradigm there, the choice. Either Jesus, who claimed to be God, was either a liar or a lunatic, or he truly was God and Lord of all. And so we left you last week with a question. Okay, we know the scriptures say at the end, every knee will bow. Who are you going to be bowing to? Are you going to be bowing to this Jesus who is your Lord and Savior or bowing to the God who you denied? Um, we also said last week that a no decision is no decision. Um, so that's kind of where, where we left it. If you get the, the progression of where we're at now, this week we're talking about did Jesus really rise from the dead. We're going to talk about his resurrection. And here with me tonight is Pete Lackey. If we could have the wide camera here. <coughs> All right. Hi, Pete. Hi, Jamie. Welcome. Oh, welcome to you. <laughs> All righty. Well, Pete is, I turned the wrong page here, he's on staff at McLean Bible, and you are the Director of Preparing for Marriage, yep. right? Yep, Director of Preparing for Marriage. Fantastic. So. You've been, how long have you been a member here? I've been part of the church since 1996. 96. Uh, first guy I actually led to Christ was involved in a Buddhist cult. I led cool. him to Christ, and he came to McLean Bible Church, and I soon followed, fell in love with the place. Fantastic. By the way, you'll find out soon enough, Pete is very shy and reserved, so you're going to have to egg him on a little bit. Here's my Marco Rubio for you, Washington. There, there, there you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Pete, you're married. Yes, I'm married. I would think that'd be important, being a director of marriage. Yes, uh, that's right. Yeah, that's pretty good. You've got children. I have three kids. Great. Uh, what are their ages? Uh, Jonah's 14, Sarah's 12. And Nathan is nine, and each one of them are unique and wonderfully made. So. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Yeah. Anyway, before we go on, we're going to start with a prayer. But, you know, I just did an introduction, overview of the first two weeks. Every teacher does it a little bit different. Do you have yeah. anything to add? Yeah, I do. I just thought it was so fascinating how you said that. And, and I want folks to understand it's so important why we just don't start with Jesus. We literally start the class in Christianity 101. I've been teaching the class for a while here at yeah. the church. It's just a great class. I just love all the men that God's brought in to kind of teach this class. But it's so powerful because here's what the book of Hebrews says to us. Hebrews 11, uh, 1, really talks about what faith is. It says, mm. now by faith, faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we do not see. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because, get this, anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. We cannot tell you that the Bible is the Word of God if there isn't a God who exists to have a Word. Jamie, if I say Jesus is the Son of God, you will never grasp that if there's no God who exists to have a Son. So we start with general revelation because your response to general revelation makes all the difference in the world. And sometimes yeah. us in the Western culture, we think we're so slick because we have all these books. Actually, I think we hide general revelation so much. I, I was agree. in the middle of Australia in the middle of the desert looking and it gets you emotional when you see the handiwork of God. But the glasses you're wearing, the worldview glasses that you put on, will really determine what you see. Now, um, atheist uh, faith is declared by Richard Dawkins. He says this, and I quote, I believe but cannot prove that all life, all intelligence, all creativity, and all design anywhere in the universe is the direct or indirect product of Darwinian natural selection. So the worldview glasses you put on will determine your view of God. Hmm. Now, what's so important is that everyone knows that the universe had a beginning and came into existence at a certain point in time out of nothing. So either no one created something out of nothing or someone created something out of nothing. Jamie, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, my friend, because yeah. nothing is nothing. And that someone who created something out of nothing is God himself. And if you respond to the light of creation, the light of conscience, the moral law in our heart, hmm. and the sense of eternity in the hearts of men, Ecclesiastes 3.11 had. I just did a funeral this uh, last week, and the sense of eternity was quickened in the hearts of people there. Hmm. No one sat there and looked at the Bible and said, oh, well, that's it. I was able to say with certainty 
that his name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life because I knew him personally and he had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. His sin book, his record of wrongs was nailed to the cross on earth. Mm. Therefore, his name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That sin book can exist with the Book of Life in heaven. That's beautiful. And so the body you saw there, that wasn't the man who died because That's he's right. living. And this is where the resurrection really ties in. Because that same body that died, that same body that died, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. That body will rise again. And when he, if the Lord Jesus comes while we're sitting right here, we're gone and I will see Jim in the air. That's right. how powerful it is. Fantastic. So. That's fantastic. We, we can almost call that a night, couldn't we? But we won't. <laughs> we won't. Let me open in prayer. Yeah, yeah please do. All right. And then we'll get into the lesson tonight's lesson. Father God, we thank you so much. You are the God. You are the creator. You're Lord. You lowered yourself to come to earth as a man and forgave us of our sins. And Lord, we thank you so much for that. Lord, we rejoice in you. We regale in your love. And even though it's overwhelming um, and almost unbelievable, we accept it openly, Lord. We are undeserving sinners, and yet you are a loving God, a great God, and we love you. Thank you so much for this night. Thank you so much for everyone who's uh, tuned in, who's listening. Uh, Lord, I pray that your word would go forth. I pray that the truth would go forth. If there are questions out there, Lord, I pray that you would enable us to answer them. And Father, um, we just ask that you be with us here tonight. Be with Pete as he mm -hmm. teaches and instructs us. And I, Father, I pray that this would honor you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Pete, let's launch in. Like All I right. said. <clears throat> All right, well, we're going to talk uh, tonight about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, back to what we were talking about the, at the beginning. It is very important because if God exists, if mm -hmm. this is a theistic universe, that right. means this is the effect. The effect can never be greater than the cause. That's the principle of causality. So this is what science is founded on. So the laws of nature are how things regularly occur because God's an orderly God. So God can step in because he has authority over nature at the end of the cause. He's greater than it at a particular point in time to do what to us is miraculous, but for what him is natural at any point in time. And if he does that, Jamie, he's going to do it for a very specific reason. And that reason is going to tell us something. He's going to take those fingerprints and come into time and eternity. And that's what Jesus Christ, that's who he is. That's what he represents, actually. So when we talk about the resurrection today, you have to believe that miracles are not only possible, yeah. but miracles are actual. A God who could bring everything into existence out of nothing, take nothing and bring in something, can do something with something. And if God is walking on earth in human flesh as Jesus Christ, God can certainly take a little bit of wine and make a lot of wine. <laughs> He can do, take a little bit of bread and make a lot of bread. God can do anything. He will be confirming the fact that he's God because he is doing things in the effect that we can't do. And it's not psychosomatic. It'll have to be real and regular. So when we look back in history, we're looking back at these proofs of history. And I want to give you four facts that we're actually going to go over today. Okay. We're going to go over these four facts are tested in history. A matter of fact, Gary uh, Habermas, one of the experts in the re resurrection, had looked at scholarly works, 2,200 of them since 1975, and found out that over 75% of scholars agreed to these four facts. They're historical facts. And when you look at history, yes, Let sir. Let me interrupt you. I don't no. want to uh, no. interrupt your flow, but are you going into the proof of the resurrection, or are you going to tell us about why is it important first? Both of them All are, right. are they're tied together. Okay, fair enough. Because fair enough. you have to look at... You have so I've got sure. some questions, my friend. Oh, no, that's great. You okay. have to have the right glasses when you're looking at the topic. All right, so you're, you're laying the table. Laying you're setting the, the table. table. Okay. Because uh, basically, the classic, I'm going to um, tell you what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, and tell you what I told you. Okay, So Fair enough. The idea is we have, um, when you're looking into history, you're looking at something different. You're taking what's used legal evidences or okay. like forensic science. So you're going to try to explain what are known facts. And this is what's called abductive reasoning. And I've heard of inductive and deductive. I don't know abductive. Abductive reasoning was actually a phrase coined by Darwin himself. Oh. It is reasoning to the best explanation with the data available. So here's the data available. So there's four facts that we're going to talk about today. And it is the empty tomb. It's agreed the fact that there's the empty tomb. The fact that Jesus was buried. The fact that he died on the cross. And then the fact that there was post-mortem experiences. After his death, people experienced Jesus Christ in the flesh. So what's so interesting about this is that when God's talking about what we're going to look back on and we're going to see something, he's going to leave these fingerprints. Blessed are those who, 
who don't see but believe, yeah. but we are believing off of what we do see. He could have not left his fingerprints in there. Why didn't the disciples make up something classic and say, hey, you know what? Jesus was raised spiritually. That's kind of unfalsifiable. How can I prove, right. hey, Jesus was raised spiritually. How are you going to disprove I can't disprove that. that. I can't. You can't disprove it. It's kind right. of a silly thing. So that's something you would find out if someone's making up a story. Right. And this is important because if Jesus Christ did not rise, you are still in your sins, my friend. And God help me, the Guinness Book of World Records of sinners, myself, I am still in my sins. Everything I believe is worthless. Everyone logged in on your computer today. You're wasting your time. I'm wasting my time away from my family. It's a waste of time. Mm -hmm. The resurrection is that critical. It's everything. So let's go ahead and get into that. All right, the question is, did Jesus really rise from the dead? So what we're going to do is we're going to give you these, these four facts, and we're gonna, everyone has to explain it, no matter what worldview glasses you put on. Okay. Everyone's going to have to explain these four facts. So let's take a look at it. Um, Michael Cohen has this. With scientific evidence and arguments for God, we only get modest conclusions, and that's what we talked about with general revelation. At best, you get the fact that God exists, which is really important. Because, mm -hmm. again, what's, what's faith? If God Assurance doesn't exist, that's the start of it. You okay. have to believe that God exists. The resurrection technically kills two birds with one stone because the resurrection says who that God is. It answers the who question. And Christianity then is true if God exists. So really, really kind of interesting statement there by uh, Mike Lacona. So why and who, is so it So you can back up a little bit. Yeah, who, sure, who, you, you had this... Um, Michael go back. Yeah, he yeah who, a, who was the historian? He's an, yeah, he's an historian. Oh, okay. He's an understudy of Gary Habermas. So, um, I, I mean, I love Gary Habermas. So he's an understudy of him. Uh, so he's, he's again, there's so many people popping up talking about the resurrection. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. Of a topic is you got t books coming out from Oxford University Press. You got books coming out from Erdman's, which is a scholarly publisher. So it's kind of interesting that this topic is still at the top of mm -hmm. debate right now. Because guess what? Since uh, Israel became a na nation, we are doing archaeology and we are finding more and more things. We find the tomb, uh, the bone box of Caiaphas. Right. We find the James Osiri, the brother of Christ. Kind of neat. Like so, I said before, the more they dig out of the ground, the more they find out the absolutely. Bible to be true. And it's just fascinating. And isn't it interesting that God did that right in a time when those things are being attacked? Exactly. When we're in a culture that worships the sheepskin and not the shepherd? Yeah. Uh, that he's providing more and more of those fingerprints and proofs available to us. Uh -huh. More forensic evidence for us. It's kind of neat. Good. So we're a culture that needs it. All right. Well, why is it important? You know, we kind of touched on that a little bit. But really, it is the heart of the gospel message. As a matter of fact, uh, in Galatians 1... The only time the word anathema, which, I mean, that is like, it is bad stuff. Is right. If you preach another gospel, another Jesus than the one preached you, I say to you, it's anathema. I say to you again, Paul repeats himself. Mm. If there's another Jesus, another gospel preached, it is anathema. The gospel is so important. So if you believe in a Jesus that didn't rise from the dead, you didn't believe the Jesus of Christianity. You got the wrong identity. Right. So we're in a time of where we're following our identity. So you you just friended, sent a friend request to the wrong uh, Facebook person. It's not the right <laughs> Jesus. So anyone of us who's done that before. Uh, it's the heart of the gospel message. So let's take a reading of 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 1 through 5, and pay particular attention to this because it's a very interesting verse. Um, now, brothers, I want to remind you. So here's the Apostle Paul. Pause right here. He is the Apostle Paul. He's the only apostle who came to Christ and was saved by the resurrected Christ. That's true. The resurrected Christ chose Apostle. Apostle was res Paul was responsible for killing the first Christian. Yep. Unbelievable. So here he is now preaching Christ's resurrection. He says, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel. Here it is. That I preach to you, which you received and on which you've taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. And here, right inserted in here, is an early creed that the Apostle Paul himself, historians believe that he received this at Jerusalem or at Damascus when he was blind and made to see. This early creed was memorized by the early Christians. Because remember, as many books as we have, uh, it's shame on us, right? We have all these books, but we don't read them. Hmm. They, they didn't have a lot of books back in that culture. Books were very expensive. Yeah. So they memorized these creeds. So look at this creed that's traced back to the first few years. For what I received, I pass to you as first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Look at the formula. That he was buried, number two. That he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Peter and then the twelve. Kind of cool. 
Question. Yes. I can count, I think. Talking about the third day, he raised on the third day. It was yeah. Friday. Yeah. And then Sunday, he was right. That's two days. Yeah. How is, is scripture wrong here? No, scripture is not wrong. He was raised on third day. He was raised on Sunday because we're talking about the fact that the Friday started from, uh, the Sabbath started from darkness on, on Friday on into Saturday morning and all day Saturday. You can't do anything. So you're preparing your meals and everything. Mm -hmm. So Christ was raised on Sunday, which is so important because you start seeing these early Jews who were commanded to obey the Sabbath all of a sudden start changing their worship right. to Sunday. Okay. Something significant had to happen for that to occur. But uh, isn't it true that in the Hebrews, um, in the culture, a part of a day counts as a full yeah, day? Yeah. So, like, if you count the hours, they it's do somewhere sun, they around do sun, 48. They do sundown, because they go okay. by the sun, we go by a 24-hour day. All right, day, so, so we got Friday, noon to, when, yeah. you know, yeah, to that's Saturday, and then part of Sunday. So that's, that's right. That's, that's our count Absolutely. of the three-day. Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. So, okay. Uh, if there was no Oh, and then one other question. Yeah. Sorry, I'll let you Not get going. By. I've got, it says, and then to the twelve. Yeah. Judas Iscariot? No, no, that uh, he was buried and then he was raised again on the third day. They appeared to Peter and then to the 12. Remember, Peter took an Old Testament method and cast lots and he chose Matthias. Yes. Remember that in the book right. of Acts? Well, Peter was actually acting in disobedience because he forgot something. Jesus is the one who handpicked the apostles. Have you ever heard of a Matthias outside of Acts 1? I never did. Yeah. And there's a reason for it because Jesus picked Paul. And Paul did not right. see himself in that light because guess what? This is really cool because that proves that this is an early creed passed on to Paul before Paul got saved. It goes right back to the first few years after the resurrection. Paul was given a creed that he memorized hmm. and that include, uh, included Matthias. That's very interesting. Very fascinating. Okay. So that's why people believe it was traced to Damascus or Jerusalem because Paul didn't see himself as the apostle yet. At that point in time. Mm -hmm. But the 12 Absolutely. does refer to him, of course. Uh, well, no, no, no. Uh, no. no. Peter, Peter and then the 12. It actually refers to the 12 cool. as a whole. So early on. Oh, in the, got, yep. it. Got, yep. it. got it. Got yep. it. Got it. Got it. All right. Upper room. He went. Uh, got it. Okay. When they were hiding, which we'll talk about later. All right. Um, if there's no resurrection, then there is no salvation. Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's tied right into the gospel message. All Christianity collapses if this is not true. It crumbles if this is not true. Here it goes again. And this is what we talked about earlier. If you take the whole, uh, the whole verse earlier and go right down, it says, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. The, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, then we are to be pitied more than all men. What an amazing statement. Mm -hmm. If Again, the resurrection is tied. So let's take a look. Before at we go some on, I'm sorry to interrupt you again, no. but I, I'm just this. There's so much in this this uh -huh. First Corinthians passage, 15. Yep. Paul is putting out the hypotheticalist, and he's saying, okay, let's say, for instance, there is no resurrection. He's yep. saying, well, then we're all to be pitied because this is yep. the truth. This is the fact that we all base everything that we have on. Yep. Yep. And he, he's all, all in. All the chips are on the table on this one issue. That's right. You disprove the, the, the resurrection, then we are to be pitied because we're foolish. We, you know, yeah. we're, we're believing a lie. Everything we're doing, everything we're sacrificing is faulty, right? Yep. I mean, it, this is a big deal. It's saying if there is no resurrection, then, then not even Christ has been raised. We'll get to that. That's important right. there. Now, th he's, at the time, in the Jewish culture, there are two groups. One believes in resurrection, yeah. one didn't. There's the Pharisees and there's the Sadducees. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. That's why they were Sadducee. So that, they did not believe in the resurrection. So what is so cool, you see the Apostle Paul, who was a Pharisee. And yeah. he actually pins them against each other all the time. Okay. And so did Christ. So it's kind of neat uh, seeing the, the, these two uh, uh, groups of people that he's pinned against. And what he's saying, So this though, is contentious on all kinds oh, of no, levels. Oh, no, it very much is. And what he's okay. saying, you have to understand, he's speaking to people who are still alive. When Christ raised the tomb, still there, people know each other, and we'll talk about that when we get into eyewitnesses. It's okay. kind of interesting. Yeah. So he's making a bold statement that people can stand up and say, "Hey, that's not true." Mm -hmm. You know, kind of like with with nine eleven, right? Someone right. comes out and says something. Oh, it was a conspiracy, really. All of a sudden, here's all the evidence. People still alive. They know. Nice try, pal. Okay, got it. Yeah, nice got try. It. So. It just doesn't hold water. So let's take a look at Jesus' death really quick. This is so important. And some say, well, why are we talking about you know, Jesus' death? Well, of course he died. Well, but again, Jesus Christ left fingerprints. There are fingerprints in Jerusalem, the fact that he died. So the scriptures 
testified that Jesus died on a cross for our sins. John 19, 30, when he had received the drink, Jesus says, it is finished, and he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. Again, we're seeing the two natures. Jesus was 100% God mm -hmm. and 100% man. So here, he had the authority to give up mm -hmm. his spirit. We see the Roman soldiers and their behavior testify to the fact that Jesus died. John 19 tells us this, now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus, they found that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. These guys were expert executioners, so they knew exactly what he was doing. And the reason why they broke the legs is because they were dying of asphyxiation, so they'd be pushing themselves up. Right. So when you break the legs, you can't push yourself up uh, anymore. So it's to accelerate. The Absolutely. Now, uh, what's interesting these is... These guys can be wrong? Huh? Oh. Oh, oh, hey, you know what? They could be wrong. But here we, here we end up having these guys who are expert executioners. Hmm. If they were wrong, they were dead wrong, literally, because hmm. they were killed for it. And okay. do you see some very specific details, the fact that when Jesus' side was uh, pierced, that blood and water flowed? Yeah, we talked about that last week. Yeah, Go ahead and so say it's it. such a cool thing. Yeah. Well, what's neat, though, is um, what you may not know is that the Journal of American Medical Society, back in 1986, okay. right around Easter, had actually done a study looking at this because this theory was coming around that Jesus didn't die, really die on a cross. He the, kind the of swoon theory. Swoon, yeah, yeah, kind of like a... Jerusalem version of Weekend at Bernie's, you know, Jesus kind of showed up and was trying to convince people he uh, resurrected from dead when he's, okay. you know, half dead walking around here. So here's what the uh, quote to quote the conclusions uh, of the medical research. Clearly, quote, the weight of the historical medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead before the wound onto his side was inflicted. And this, this supports the traditional view that the spear thrust between his right rib probably perforate, perforated not only the right lung but also the pericardium which yeah. is why this, that's that sack that's why the water flew and the heart and thereby ensured his death accordingly interpretations based on the assumption that jesus did not die on the cross get this appear to be at odds with modern medical knowledge if you have um, lexus nexus access it's JAMA uh, version um, 1463, March 21st, 1986. Pretty, okay. pretty cool. That's very uh, cool. Evidence. Really neat. So just a, another thing, it's showing that the, the eyewitness testimony, that someone saw that that's what happened, that's what was recorded in the scriptures. Uh, the other thing is... Um, just a little side note. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you guys didn't notice it, John 19, 34 is right here in your book on page mm -hmm. 22. It, the scripture brings it out, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. Science, you know, people read this for centuries and weren't quite understanding it, but Absolutely. science right now is just endorsing, saying, yep, there Absolutely. it is. Absolutely. Because at the time, in medical knowledge, they were like, what do you mean, water flowing? Exactly. That don't make any sense. Exactly. So you just imagine, all of a sudden, the Lord sneaks in, here it goes, we know now. So, again, this, is, this was their job, was oh, to crucify folks. Sorry, a little no. I'm babbling no, here. No, I love it. I love this. I'm excited about it. Uh, the more you get into this... Uh, Christians don't have to fear science. That's what I'm trying no. to say. Oh my gosh, Christians science verifies. Science. Thank you. Yes, yeah. Go a lot ahead. of people take, don't take away. This, that Francis Bacon, the founder of the modern scientific method, actually wrote uh, some uh, commentary. Here's what uh, Francis Bacon said. There are I can't believe you actually have that. Yes, I do. There are two <laughs> books laid before us to study to prevent us from falling into error. First, the volume of scriptures, Francis Bacon says, mm. which reveal the will of God. Then the volume of the creatures which express his power. Mm. Pretty awesome. That's amazing. There's a reason why science flourished in a Christian theistic culture. They believed, he believed it was his duty to study God's, God's creation. creation. It was his duty to do it. Kind of neat. That's very neat. Very so, neat. Now, no, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, now, here's what's interesting. Those who saw Jesus knew that he's dead. This one against all hopes. You just imagine, just kind of picture this, right? Someone you believe in, you're following. You seem to do miraculous things. You're waiting for the kingdom to come. These Romans are treating you like total garbage. And they're going to, he's going to come in. And mm -hmm. He's going to, it's time. It's on. I know he's the Messiah. And he's dead. Yeah. He's dead. Peter went fishing, went back to what he knew. So those who saw him, John 19, later Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. This is really important. 
because this means we know the location hmm. of the tomb. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who had earlier visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about, get this, 75 pounds. They were literally trying to prepare the body and give Jesus Christ a proper burial. Mm. So they didn't want him to be hung on a tree and taken down. They wanted to give him a proper burial. More than likely, gave his tomb his personal right. tomb, away to him. So it's kind of powerful. So this is why when the other leaders, you can figure out, figured out what was going on, they go to the Pilate and say, hey, they're going to go say that Jesus rose from the dead and steal his body. And Pilate sends what? A whole legion of soldiers over there uh, to watch over the tomb. He knew where to go. Um, sorry to hit on yeah. some details, but Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Mm -hmm. At this point, do we presume that he's a believer, a follower of Christ? Yeah, he's a follower of Christ as much as what's known at that point. Okay. Right? Because he doesn't believe in the resurrection at that point because the resurrection never occurred. So he has a. He's, he's but a he is a Pharisee, a, not a Sadducee. Uh, absolutely. So he believes in. Oh, yeah, he believes that the resurrection. Uh, but they're okay. thinking general resurrection. At yeah, the end of the all age. right, all right. They're, they're, they're not waiting for part two. Okay, yeah, not yeah. Jesus specific resurrection That's at right. this point. So they're preparing him for the burial, the body, yeah. the Jewish. Okay, yeah, got absolutely. It. No, that's great. That's a great all question. Right. So really cool. Um, and, and it says here, those who saw Jesus knew he was dead. Yep. They were both believers, uh, followers, and uh, those who opposed Jesus. Saw. Where is that at? Oh, just uh, above it. Uh, those who saw Jesus yeah, knew. Yeah, those he, who saw Jesus knew, uh, he knew that he had died. So, so both assume. both people who um, uh, wanted to believe, and yep. those people who didn't really want to. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, so if you sit there and you look at this, you end up seeing that taking that reasoning, you know that he died, right? And then there's some certain hypotheses that come up here. Now, what happens is people are trying to find kind of a natural explanation on kind of what could have happened. Right. Right. And there's lots of theories that are formed. This goes into the glasses you see. The atheist who would look at it and say, well, miracles are impossible because creation's all there is. Mm -hmm. And uh, someone who's a Christian believes God exists says, well, no, we're in a theistic universe. Miracles are possible. So okay. what you glasses you wear, you're going to come up with naturalistic explanations to try to explain these four facts. Because there's these explanations means that these facts are legitimate in history. So one of them was like, hey, what about this kind of mass uh, hallucination? You know, what if, you know, there's this hallucinate, they all hallucinate. Well, the problem is that the tomb was empty and you don't have group hallucinations. Yeah. You can have a hallucination, but you and I, our minds aren't linked. We aren't going to have this group hallucination. Not mm -hmm. only just us, but then you're talking about the 12. Now we're talking about over 500, which we'll get to in a moment. So that won't work. Uh, the problem is, hey, it's a fraud. They kind of made up the story, right? Hey, sure. they made up the story. The question is, would you really die for a lie? So we'll start seeing here that these disciples, they're hiding right now at this point. Right. So remember, they're all in the upper room and they're hiding. They're scared. I mean, <laughs> I mean, their tails are between their legs. They're gone. They're done. Uh, the other thing is, well, it's just a metaphor, right? It's just a metaphor that we don't know what it's there for. Well, so we'll pour <laughs> our own meaning into it. Well, there's no convincing proof. There's real conversions happening. People don't convert and die for a metaphor. <laughs> okay. So what did um, the Apostle Paul metaphorically get stoned to death, right? Uh, that doesn't happen that way. Um, right. they, Something very physical, very real yeah. happened. Forget the metaphor Absolutely. stuff. That, that's, a, that's the weak one. That's, that's the weak one. Really then we got the weekend at Bernie's uh, thing. Now, can you imagine this, right? Imagine Jesus beaten with uh, lashes. If you saw the Passion of the Christ, that was close, but it was worse. Hmm. All this blood loss, that's why I actually died on the cross and why they pierced his side. He, that's why he was already dead. So imagine him going along his way. Well, there's, there's problems with that here that, well, maybe just pure dead. The weekend of Bernie's thing doesn't work. Well, let's take a look at the scriptures. I want to show you what happened. And I'm going to give you some really neat uh, information about historians around that time of Christ. And they actually confirm these two pieces of information I have here in red. So let's take a look at it. From the sixth hours of Matthew 27, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over the whole land. So you would think that people who were alive during that time, whether they believed it or not, or experienced this. Mm -hmm. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when Jesus cried out in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. 
So let's take a look at historians during that time who actually wrote about these events. Now here's what I want you to notice. Notice that they're trying to give a naturalistic explanation for these events. So there's nothing new under the sun. All right, you said the sixth hour and the twelfth hour, or ninth hour. Ninth hour. So that is from well, no. no, noon. No, yep. Noon to three o'clock. Sure. So in the middle of the day, total eclipse. Dark. Oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. Oh, it, it's not just the darkness. Oh no, cover the whole point. land. Something happened. So yeah, okay. here's with Phallus in 52 AD. Now Jesus died around 33 AD, or 31 AD. No one knows because there's no zero in how you do your calendars, which is what we're talking about a little bit here. Yeah. Uh, look what he explains uh, in history, his historian of Trojan Wars. He says in the third book of history, he explains away the darkness after the crucifixion. He says it's an eclipse of the sun, reasonably as it seems to me. Now, here Flagian goes and wants to respond to this. He says the eclipse in the time of Tiberius Caesar, he points to it, in whose reign Jesus appears to have been crucified, evidence of the crucifixion, and the great earthquakes that then took place. If he's trying to explain away darkness over the whole land, calling it the eclipse, what does that mean about the event, Jamie? That it happened. But, but that's true. That's true. You don't something explain something. Yeah, he's defending happen. something. Isn't that, that cool? Yeah. When well, you kind of look at it, it's kind of neat. Yeah. But look. But it doesn't explain. That's the eclipse. Doesn't oh, explain yeah. anything about the earthquakes. Oh yeah. He oh, has yeah, no answer absolutely. for that. Absolutely. So he's talking about this. He's like, well, let me explain it. Yeah. Now okay. look at this other quote. Uh, Jesus, while he's alive, was no assistance to himself. So Flay's kind of making fun of him. What's up with this guy? But that he rose after death and exhibited the marks of his punishment and showed how his hands had been pierced by nails. So here you have him talking about the fact that hey, while he's alive. No, no use to himself. But yeah. he's talking about these appearances. So where he got this witness to these appearances, he's not a believer. Yeah. Is, I don't know where he got this. But this testimony about it is very, very close within the first century. Well, he's right at a time yeah. where there's still some contemporaries Absolutely who could refute about. it or not. Absolutely. So it's kind of neat. So that's a little side uh, note um, just to let you know that these things are attested in history. And right. you see that people are trying to explain it away. Yeah. Really, really neat. So it means that the event actually happened. So we know he died. We see this all this types of information about his death. But then the question is, well, what about his burial? So we know that the fact that he's buried, the empty tomb, this is another fact of history. So I showed you some extra information to show that, hey, you see these other things that are uh, other writers talk about these facts in yeah. history. This is why people kind of uh, believe it. Now they have to explain it. Now look at this. His body was prepared for burial, and it was placed in a rock tomb, and then the rock rolled over uh, the entrance. Uh, Mark uh, 15, 46. So Joseph brought some linen cloth, took the body down, wrapped it in linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. He then rolled the stone against the entrance of the tomb. Now look what the guards come. Do so we have any idea how big this rock is? Oh, I don't. I mean, I don't. Okay. Uh, some people do, but I don't. It's, okay. a, it's a pretty big rock. Okay. I mean, we're talking uh, the poundage is pretty large, so right. I don't want to say a number because I don't have it uh, okay. memorized. Cool. So, but it's a big rock from what I understand. So. Oh, 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 oh. look, t t right here. Possibly weighing as much as two tons. Hey, possibly. Look at that. Little note there. Didn't see it. Bottom page 22 possibly if you want to check tons. that. So. Okay. Look at that. And that's, so that's archaeology coming to our That's a ton, a ton of rock right that's there. That's a lot of so. rock. Okay, I'm that's sorry. That's a lot. No, it's great. It's okay, a lot good. of rock. Now, once the entrance was sealed and then a guard placed around it. Now, when you put Caesar's wax seal on there, yeah. if you break that seal, punishable by death. And they know it. So they sealed that tomb, basically saying this tomb is sealed by Caesar. And then you have the soldiers sitting there watching it. So here's uh, Matthew 27. Let's let the scriptures talk about it. The next day, uh, the one uh, after preparation day, the chief priests and Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while you're still alive, that that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, the disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that they've been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. Early right. Sunday morning, the tomb was empty. So they know the body went in. They know he was prepared. Mm -hmm. Seal, rolled stone, guard, and their post of guard. All of a sudden, early Sunday morning, the tomb was empty. Check this out from Matthew 28. Um, After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and Mary went to look at the tomb. 
There was a violent earthquake, for the angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Wouldn't you? Oh, That's absolutely. a very accurate description of what the experience would be like. Now, there's a group of guards here. Oh, yeah. Trying to do it, and they're all terrified. And yet, what would be their task? Their task would be to arrest the angel. Absolutely. <laughs> they're probably absolutely. saying, I have nothing to do with that. I'm not doing anything absolutely. with that. Yeah, okay. I, and I love the accuracy of just the response. So, the yeah. angel, this is how, you don't get that in myth, right? The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, he is risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay, then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going on ahead of you in Galilee. Then you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb. Now get this. Look at this experience. Afraid, yet filled with joys. Mm -hmm. And yet they ran to tell his disciples. Now what's so interesting about this is if you are going to make up a story, about Jesus rising from the dead, right. you certainly would not have women That's true. finding the tomb. Because this is a key piece of evidence. If the tomb's empty saying Jesus rose from the dead, you're going to have Peter the Rock, <laughs> one of the manly men, find it. You aren't going to have women, one of them a, a, a converted prostitute. Yeah, Peter the Rock was hiding. Right? Peter the Rock was okay. hiding. Just, just <clears throat> the women are running towards the tomb. Right. Okay. So what's interesting is that a woman's testimony at that time was not even valid in the court of law. And we're talking about kind of legal evidences here. Yeah. Reasonable doubt kind of evidence here. Now, many of the first century rabbis actually taught that it was better, look at this, better to burn the law than to teach it to a woman. Wow. Jesus Christ elevated women. Christianity yes. elevated in a, women in a culture where they did not matter. That's what women were converting like crazy. Kind of neat. Um, so a few other make up that story. Some more details here. A violent earthquake. We're reading back up to Matthew 28. A violent earthquake. That's the second major earthquake in three yeah. days. Yeah. They had one Friday. Now they're having one Sunday. Absolutely. They must know something's going on. Yeah. You have the eclipse in the middle of the day. You have the temple rent in two. Yeah. You've got all the destruction going on, the <clears> earthquakes. People must be saying, what is going on? Yeah. Who is this man? Absolutely, absolutely. Now you see some of that response. I love in Luke 24, 11, so the women go and they tell the men, right? And the men, <laughs> I love this response, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed like nonsense. Yeah. You just got to love, then it sounds like nonsense, right? People don't rise from the dead, Jamie. Yeah. So their words, now here it is once again, doubting Peter. Always going, well, uh, and he's hiding. He just got them betraying the Lord, and he's in hiding at this moment. So, very, very cool. So, let's take a look at what else. Earlier it was empty. Now, after uh, appearances after his resurrection, so, ha okay, we have him get dead. We have the, the tomb where he's at. We know that it's empty. We have women finding it, of all and, things. And, by the way, we know it's the right tomb. We know it's the right I tomb. I mean, it can't be mistaken. Another well, rock, well, another guard. Multiple yeah. people would have to be mistaken, right? Because yeah. Joseph of Arimathea, all of a sudden he doesn't know where his own tomb is. Right. Uh, Pilate doesn't know where it is. The guard don't know where it is. Uh, Everyone knows where it is. Oh, I've heard that believe. too. I've heard that said though. They, they went to the wrong tomb. I mean, absolutely. Really? Again, a naturalist explanation. So if you're using okay. this kind of reason, would you say, does that make sense okay. compared to what we know to be true? It just doesn't. It right. just doesn't jive. Again, so you're, you're looking for the preponderance of evidence. Preponderance you're saying of evidence. what is logical with given the reports that we have. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Just like yeah. you do in a court okay. of law. So that's what we're doing here. Okay. I've got a question if we could yeah. now. Um, this one just came in. Is yeah. there any evidence for the temple curtain being torn? Well, evidence I, to that. Okay, outside evidence. Yeah. I don't know of anything that I know that someone wrote about it or something like that that I myself know. But again, there's so much that we don't have because remember the temple was destroyed, destroyed. in 70 AD. Right. So that is a huge marker in Jewish history, mm -hmm. and actually that's a fulfilled <clears throat> prophecy. Another evidence that the New Testament is dated earlier because Acts, the book of Acts does not record the temple being destroyed. It would clearly say, as the Lord told us would occur, the mm. temple was destroyed. And how does the book of Acts start? In my former book, Theophilus. Here what was go. Luke's former book? Luke's. I put Luke earlier than Acts. One of those neat things about the, the Word of God. Mm. But yeah, I don't know, uh, have things like that, but we know just from everything else when you put it together, 
knowing that the rock split, knowing that there's an earthquake, that's something that you would expect to occur. Mm -hmm. So and then the temple itself destroyed. So you have God doing his second hammer on that. So, right. but so okay. many things were destroyed during that time. Okay, um, good. Very, that's a great question. It's a good though. question. So I Thank don't you know for anything it. in archaeology myself. So, no, I'm not familiar. Absolutely. So okay. the Lord will, if there is, he'll reveal it at the right time. Right. There you go. So that's been his uh, pattern. Okay. Appearances after his resurrection. Again, he appeared uh, to the women at the tomb. We talked about that. Uh, the next thing is he appeared to his disciples. I love this. John 20. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews. They are still hiding, folks. <laughs> the, you have to understand, yes. picture it. Their leader is dead. Right. Their hopes are destroyed. They, these men are suffering right now probably from a bad case of PMS, poor me syndrome. You know, I've been following this guy, and he's, you know, and well, what did he do to me? Okay, and Jesus said imagine. himself. Like, what are you Jesus doing? said himself. Let me yeah, uh, sure. pick on this a little bit. He said himself that he's going to um, come back in three days, right? Absolutely. Uh, that was the sign of Jonah, right? Yeah. Is that what he's referring to? He said, I'll give yeah. you the sign of Jonah. So that was the one sign that he was giving um, on the three days. So they heard that. He and said, so their expectations must have been something totally different for them not to be able to absolutely. embrace this. Because what, people don't rise from the dead, Jamie. So imagine their thoughts going, okay, so he must have met something else. What if it was a metaphor? You've you got to imagine they had okay. no Jewish expectation in their mind. Everything before them, this is why... Faith is so important. Mm -hmm. Everything in front of them said, Jesus isn't who he said he was. What do we do? What do we do now? How do we explain it? You can imagine them with all the scripture they memorized and all the experiences. I can't fathom what that small group conversation must look like. What do we do? Right. So they're okay. hiding for fear, fear of the Jews. So you have a disciple telling him, telling us that this is what they are doing. Right, so one of the guys are hiding, and and you know, how embarrassing is it? The Holy Spirit inspiring them to talk about the women finding the tomb, and they're mm. all hiding. So, Jesus came and stood among them and said, "He imagines, hey, peace be with you." But <laughs> after he said this, he immediately went for evidence. Yeah, God's always been pro evidence. Yeah, he is. He knows how we are. That we use faith and reason, we put it together. He's always been like that. <laughs> he stood before them, peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So let me ask you a question. Is that a different body? No. Because no. that was the same body that was resurrected. Absolutely. Is it a spiritual body? No, it's physical, tangible. Physical. If you can put your finger in Absolutely. that. Yeah. Absolutely. Great, great. After he had said this, he showed up his hands, okay? And his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the 12 was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So he's going to literally, we kind of have fun and call him, let's use the phrase, doubting Thomas. Mm -hmm. But guess what? Everyone else was doubting too. <laughs> Thomas wasn't there when they knew. Yeah. So the other disciples told him, hey, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where his nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. Then Jesus said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, oh, wait a minute, I'm not God. How dare you worship me? Oh, no, wait a minute. That's not what the scripture says. Yeah. He received the worship. He received it. Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those, us, who have not seen and yet believed. We did not see the resurrected Christ, yeah. but we see all of the evidence and signs mm -hmm. of the resurrected Christ. That God is real and he loves us and died on the cross for That's us. That's a great verse. That's a great Such verse. A great Blessed verse. are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's us. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, let's see. Let's look at now note there's certain facts uh, from this passage. Uh, the nail marks on his hand and his side. So they knew it really was Jesus. They mm -hmm. knew it was him. Right? Uh, he appeared uh, bodily form. We know that. Uh, what's so cool in Luke uh, 24, he actually eats fish. So we'll eat in a, re uh, <laughs> in a resurrected body. That's pretty, pretty cool. So it was a bodily resurrection. In their presence, there he was, risen from the dead. It's like 1 Corinthians 15, 6. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers at the same time. Look at this. Most of them are still living, though some have fallen asleep. He is so confident, the Apostle Paul, in his message of the resurrection, mm -hmm. that he's saying, check it out. Yeah. Folks, he appeared to over 500. 
It was 40 days. He appeared to me, and I went out killing Christians, headed to Damascus. I leave Damascus saying that the Christians were right and I was wrong. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine how he must have felt in his heart? Wow, that sin, oh my gosh. Right. So I always tell uh, my, uh, my friends out there when I'm, I'm talking to them about Christ is, a lot of times some of the things that really get in the way of us accepting the resurrected Christ as the Lord and Savior, is we say, I know the Lord died on the cross for my sins, but there's this one, there's this one sin that I, 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 he can't, yeah. he can't forgive me. Mm-hmm. And you now I remember I, I, I would hold that myself and people do that. Yeah. Don't do that. You ask yourself, are you running around right now killing Christians? If you're not running around killing Christians, like the apostle Paul was, thinking he had zeal for God, mm-hmm. and God saved him and used him to write one third of the New Testament, folks, that sin that you're holding in your heart is on the cross. We feel sometimes that we're not worthy, we're not worthy, but we've got to come to the realization we're not worthy. Absolutely. <laughs> Christ you, took care of it on the cross. And, and, and this is the and So don't hold thing. on to that sin oh, and let yeah. that be the impediment, the yeah, barrier absolutely. between really embracing the risen Lord. Guilt is the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. It really well is. Said. So let me... But you need it, right? You need the bad news or you'll never understand the good news. Oh, absolutely. A if false I could, gospel of self-esteem with little Jesus go. sprinkles on it. <clears throat> you know, the seven leaps to life, the eight jumps to joy. All those little <laughs> things are fairy tales. Right. True joy. If I can earn heaven, Christ. why did God have to die? Absolutely. And be crucified and resurrected. Absolutely. Um, so Jesus, look, this is so like God. He doesn't play hide and seek. He's making it real clear. He's resurrected. It says in here, 10 different appearances over a period of 40 days, that's Acts 1-3. I'm not sure if that reference is in there, but over a period of 40 days and over 500 people. So he is out and about. He is he's, out sho- and about. he's showing everyone who's willing to see this. Yeah. And then as, as you just read, you know, Paul's just saying, go check it out. Yeah. Go check it out. There's still some contemporaries who saw this. Go check mm-hmm. it out because this is what it is. So there's no doubt that Jesus' bodily resurrection. Yeah. Now, what's the... Can you elaborate a little bit more about the importance of the bodily resurrection? That wasn't just yeah, spiritual. Absolutely. Because there's, if you've studied any, any course, there's a course in college <coughs> that some of you may have had called anthropology. Uh-huh. Even if you had like psychology or something like that, you end up finding out that there's really three views of man. One is view that's called tabula rasa. It's a fancy way of saying that we all come in this world as a blank slate. Yeah. There's the second view <coughs> that we're all come in this world naturally good. And all I have to do then is ask the question, if we're all born naturally good, then why are people killing people? Right. Why, why Boston? Why? S- there is sin everywhere uh, in the world and we know it. So then where did it come from? And then this, the third view, which again makes the most sense, it's the Christian view, it's unique. It says we're the good gone bad. We're, we have the law on our heart, but we stand in rebellion to it. It's my way or the highway. Mm -hmm. I want to be God of my own life, but the bad news is you're not God of your own life, and once you realize that that bad news is actually really good news, it makes all the difference uh, in the world. So if you take this idea, the fact that we're fallen human beings, and we know it's true by our own experience, Mm -hmm. just think about your week. Um, I I mean, I'm a father of, of three kids, and if any of my kids are watching, I can tell you, that I apologize to my children about two or three times a week, and I'm not kidding. I try to keep a short leash because these kids see a saved sinner every day. And the only f- perfect father is the Heavenly Father, not me. Mm-hmm. I, I do, or I can't praise the <clears throat> Lord that I'm not who I once was and that I'm where I'm at today. So it makes a big difference because our body's tainted. Yeah. So what God is saying is that in, in Christian view of the world, matter is good. It's good. God created everything, body, soul, composite. Our body is good. So when Jesus stepped into time, into body, and was resurrected, he walked on earth with us. He was relating to us. He was living the perfect life that I can never live, that you can never live, and that you can never live out there. He lived the perfect life in our place and offers it to us as a free gift. And, uh, I'm glad you said that as a free gift. It wasn't just an example for us to aspire no. towards, to try to mimic. 
Why a lot of religions say that. We can't Absolutely. do that. We are totally incapable of doing Absolutely. that. Absolutely. You know what? I tell you what. Um, we could try to mimic <clears throat> it. Um, I'll get across. Um, I'll put it up. <laughs> and if you could tell me that your life is perfect, we'll hang you on it. But let me ask you a question. Where's your measure of your life's perfect? Hmm. You can probably measure against me and say, you know, I know Pete. And I know I'm better than him. And you're probably right. But the difference between you and the cross and you and me is a really big difference. Yeah. This is what makes Christianity fair. People talk about fairness. The yeah. grouse, ground at the cross is level. It is level. And he died on the cross for all of us. There's no earning. The person who can't do good works because they have a physical disability. They couldn't go out and do the good works that I do. They can't go running out like I can and do it. Mm -hmm. But guess what? That's why it's a free gift. God did the work for us. Exactly right. But we work from the grace that God given us. Hey, heaven was bought by Jesus Christ, but my experience on what it's like there determines what I do with what God gave me. Mm -hmm. I, but hey, I'd rather have, uh, I'd rather be in the hood in heaven than a penthouse <laughs> in hell is what I'm thinking. So yeah. I don't know. Well, I like what you say. It, it's, um, I just blanked out. Work from the grace. You don't work uh, for the you grace. You don't work for the don't grace. for the grace. Absolutely. But once you have the grace, that's yeah, absolutely. Works and this from was, the grace. This is what's so interesting. Grace is always first. Christianity is backwards in a lot of people's minds, which knows it's only God's idea. We have to receive first. We mm -hmm. have to be good receivers. Some of you say, oh, I'm a great receiver. I, I love gifts. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> I'm talking about receiving if you have a need. Let's say, uh, Jamie, you, um, uh, God help us, you lose your job. Okay. And I, I come up to you and I say, Jamie, I just paid your mortgage for the year. Your immediate reaction, I'll pay you back. I'll, I'll do this. I'll do and I'm like, no, it's a gift. How's your receiver? It requires humility. It really does. So if we receive forgiveness for ourselves, when I receive forgiveness for my sins, I was able to give that forgiveness out to my father, out to my mother, my, 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 mm. my kids, my brother. I'm able to give forgiveness because I received it for myself. If you receive unconditional love from God, then you can give unconditional love for yourself because he's the source of those qualities that we want. That's exactly what Jesus was saying. Yeah. Let you, be without, you, without the first, uh, sin, throw the, yeah. cast the first stone to the adulterer. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, you receive grace. Yeah. Therefore, you can extend Absolutely. it. And get, and get, what did Jesus say? Did Jesus say, go out and keep committing adultery because you're saved by grace? Yeah. No, he said, go and sin no more. Right. It's God's acceptance of us right where we're at uh, that Paul, gives us the strength Paul to Romans. go where he wants us to go. Uh, that it may never be. Should oh, I go on continue man. sinning? Uh, Romans 4, 5, 6. Absolutely. Read that. That's, well, that's probably, we'll get into that next week, too. Yeah, no. But anyway. Well, I wanted to show right, this life yeah. change. Because this is go really kind of neat. Go ahead. So and we, if we, I could show you guys a little life change here. Look at Peter. So let's tease you two parts of Peter. So we have Peter in Matthew 26. Uh, let's look at the at end of Matthew 26, 69 through 74. This is Peter before uh, the resurrection when Jesus died. Now, Peter was sitting out in the courtyard. So here's Jesus goes in uh, to have his trial, illegal trial at night. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, some girl said to him, she said, but he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you're one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses on himself and swore to them, I don't know the man. I don't know what the expletives look like in Greek, but they're not included. <laughs> he was really denying. And you remember the picture the Lord looks at him and yeah. he weeps. He responds in repentance and cries, oh my gosh, the Lord told him that very night at the Passover meal that, hey, you will deny me. Peter's like, no way. Now look at Acts 4, 8, <clears throat> after the resurrection. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple, because he just got done healing someone, and asked how he was healed, then know this. You of all people, Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and whom you crucified, hmm. but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone the builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found 
in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter, huh. that's just so, it, it's, it's almost worth reading again. When they <laughs> saw the courage of Peter, so he went to the cur- <laughs> you know that curvy line. You, know, so you see, put him up. You, know, you see him. That's the best I can do. John realized that they were unschooled. Oh, they didn't go to any of the poison ivy leagues, right? They were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished. Yeah, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Hmm. They didn't have the sheepskin credentials. They had the credentials of the shepherd, the resurrected. Christ, hmm. hiding, denying, cussing, swearing. What happened to Peter a few days later? He saw the resurrected Christ. The resurrection made a difference. So why is this so important? Why was this so important? Because if Christ did not rise, he is a liar. Mm-hmm. If Christ did not rise, he is not able to do anything for us now. You stand before God in your sins. The gospel message depends on it. If he did not rise, then our witness is false and our faith is empty. We have that blind faith. People say, oh, you guys have blind faith. No, 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 no. We, no, we use the tools of faith and reason to grasp reality. Mm-hmm. If you're running around like Michael Jackson, with just the one glove, you know, you think you're going to ex- explain everything by reason or explain everything. I just have faith. It isn't going to work. You need faith and reason. That's why he gives us evidence and fingerprints. Exactly. That's why he does that, because he wants us to look for him. And like you said earlier, that those who seek me find me. When you seek me with all the heart, you have to be seeking. Are you willing to put on the right glasses and mm-hmm. see? And you will see. He did not rise, and our witness is false. Faith is empty, without hope, and without hope for the future. He gives us assurance of our own resurrection. Well, let's park on that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Jesus did not have, he wasn't an apparition or a spiritual absolutely. only. Absolutely. So this is saying we will have a bodily, physical resurrection. Absolutely. A resurrection body. A resurrection body. Hey, listen, when well, I might new one have more hair? Oh, I, I, I know. I, hey, I, hey I, brother, listen, I feel you, though, but I did, I, did tell, I did tell my hair, though, I said, hey, you can turn on me, but you can't leave. So <laughs> you just, that's what you got to do with authority, you know. Uh, I guess so I have my mistake. I have more faith. You okay, know? So, <laughs> that must be it. Okay. <laughs> but what we end up seeing here is that, absolutely, when I did the funeral this past week, yeah. my friend, uh, who died in the Lord mm-hmm. and was able to say with confidence, God will take, and it's funny, you can imagine, now we know with uh, genetics, he will take that genetic code, he'll per- perfect it, he, he will give a resurrected body. I won't yeah. have this Buddha starter kit that I have. You might have a full head of hair, my gray will be gone. We will have resurrected bodies. That is our future promise. His spirit is right now with the Lord, uh, but at that, at that time, when, uh, man, when the Lord comes back, it will mm-hmm. be a resurrected body. So oh, really man, cool. Is that 1 Corinthians 16? Do you remember oh, where that gosh. is? Anyway, it's, yeah. it, they, they have a, a passage in Scripture. I think it's 1 Corinthians after 15 is my guess, uh, talking about the resurrection body. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's so anyway, much, so there's so much in there, but you can look that up. Absolutely. So great. It's just good stuff. So um, it's so, so important. Before we get to next week, I did want to share with you guys a couple things because we were talking about uh, legal, um, legal evidences here. So just to do a quick uh, kind of summary here, when we went through all this information, we talked about four facts of history that need an ex- explanation. So do you remember the, the, the term of reasoning? It's called abductive reasoning. So okay. the death of Jesus by crucifixion, the burial by Jesus of Arimathea, by Joseph of Arimathea, uh, <laughs> the empty tomb, and then post-mortem experiences, meaning in a resurrected body, there's appearances that some experience that these uh, disciples had that gave this courage of mm-hmm. Peter, which I love here. Now, what's so interesting is there's a book I have here called Testimony of the Evangelist by Dr. Simon Greenleaf. Now, Simon Greenleaf founded the Harvard School of Law, oh. and his treatise on law of evidence is a three-volume work. It's a classic in American jurisprudence. And it forms the basis for the study of jurisprudence today. So here's what he said. Some students challenged him. Uh, Witness to the professor said, hey, I'll take the C if I can convince the professor. Simon Greenleaf says, you know what? Let's take the evangelists, the apostles, and let's put them on the witness stand. Let's take a look at their testimony like we've been doing today. So let's pretend that Paul's on the witness stand, that Peter's on the witness stand, and we take the gospel's testimony, and let's put in a, a court of law, guilty, innocent, are what they're saying is true, Dr. Simon Greenleaf converts to Christianity. 
Oh, wow. And accepts Jesus as his Messiah. And here's where <laughs> Simon Greenleaf uh, had ended up saying he, he just converted. I love this. Then there's another guy uh, named Sir Lionel Lacou. I love this. He is actually in the Guinness Book of World Records right now. If you look him up, his last name is L-U-C-K-H-O-O. He's in the Guinness Book of World Records as the most successful attorney in the world. That's a pretty uh, nice title to hold. And here's what he said. He was a doubter and did the same thing that Dr. Greenleaf wanted. I wonder if he was uh, influenced by Greenleaf. I don't Hmm. know. And here's what he said. Quote, I say unequivocally that the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels the acceptance by proof, which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. Again, I say God gave us a bodily resurrection in Jesus Christ. They could have came up with this spiritual resurrection that is unfalsifiable. You can't put that liver quiver, that faith, blind faith on a witness stand. You can only put faith and reason looking at compelling evidence with eyes that see, you will believe that Jesus is your Messiah and hope he becomes your Messiah too. Excellent. Well, we need to conclude. Do we have, I think we have one more slide? Um, yes, this will be about next week. Oh, okay. Oh, someone's going to be mad at me. Oh, you're mad at me. Oh, oh look, look at the that. Bad one. You know, they Yellow already yell at me because I'm the new guy. <laughs> so it's, oh, the new guy's going to ruin the life. It says, it says if you have self, if, what does salvation mean and why do I need it? I promise you that's what actually the slide says. So, that's quite right. That, that's one I'm uh, we can go without. But anyway, Lord this is... Miracle right before you. Yep. Oh, there it is. How about that? That's very good. We do have another question. Um, what is, is there importance about Jesus being around for 40 days? The flood was 40 days and 40 nights. Is there oh, some biblical, numerical? Yes, there is, actually. Okay. Um, the number Professor. 40, uh, the number 40, I'm going to get my pipe. The number 40 is God's <laughs> number for testing. And I also God's that. number, uh, when, when God's testing, guess what Satan's doing? Tempting. Jesus went into the, um, that, I know Very this good. Uh, Very from good. studying of uh, the, the virtues. That's so kind of interesting. You, I'm so neat you brought that up. I didn't bring yeah, that up. So, that's a good question out there. That's a the great question. It's actually God's number. So God does use this, his number for testing. So we see that 40 days, 40 nights, we see the wilderness. It is God's number for testing. But when God's testing, there's another force at work, Satan tempting. So God never tempts. But he tests. He puts, puts our faith to the test. Okay. And he does it all the time. Moses had to actually put his foot in the water before it split. That's right. It was last minute, Lord, or like Lon Solomon says, hey, to pick the fruit, you have to go out on a limb. Hmm. And that is definitely true. Very good. That's Very a great good. question. Okay. Let's kind of take it from the top and just, just to capsulize or, or summarize mm-hmm. what we've talked about, Pete. You know, um, uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, that's when he's giving his dissertation, if you will, the hypothetical question, what if the resurrection didn't happen? You provide yeah. tonight great evidence. Uh, there's a preponderance of evidence. That's right. Uh, from the Bible, uh, also extra-biblical evidence. Absolutely. Just logical, sequential thinking about, okay, this is what it's all about. So, if there is no resurrection, preaching Christ would be senseless. Yep. Right? Faith in Christ, useless. Yeah, right? Absolutely. You'll be preaching actually a different Christ. There You'll you go. You'll have a different faith you're preaching and it's useless and there's lots of false Christ out there yeah you know what's kind of interesting every book in the New Testament talks about false teachers yeah that's so good. some of you out there said to go wow I see this guy and I don't know that's why I'm not believing I used to use that as an excuse too and I found out in the Bible talks about false teachers all the time have did any other teachers uh, claim to be resurrected no. or did any followers say uh, oh he was resurrected too uh, oh, any other religious system? Yeah, any religious oh. system has this idea of the resurrection no, 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 no. as the seal of approval, God uh, saying this is fact. Not at all. This was so interesting. Using the term unfalsifiable, for example, in Mormonism, mm-hmm. Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, okay. we're talking only 160 years ago, He everything mm-hmm. goes to his existential experience or maybe personal experience. I experienced Jesus appeared to me and, and then John the Baptist appeared to me and then he said this and said that and I looked in a hat and he gave me these tablets and and you say, well, prove it. Well, there's no hat. There's, there's <clears throat> nothing. It's, you can't deny something. It's unfalsifiable. So everything goes back to his testimony. I see. In Islam, <clears throat> everything goes back to Muhammad's experience in the cave of Hira. And Muhammad was scared when he had his experience in the cave of Hira. And it wasn't to his Coptic ancestor, I think you experienced the angel Gabriel. The only problem is that when Gabriel appeared, he said three times, do not fear. 
do not fear. Muhammad was scared to death. So everything went back to his experience. Okay. No other founder of a religious system has this idea of resurrection. You have the idea of reincarnation, which is not resurrection. Uh, reincarnation is not resurrection. So it is literally you live one life. It has been appointed man once to die. There you go. And then the judgment. So Christianity is the only one that has the evidence external to a person's yeah. And even his idea, experience. why would someone say that, right? Because this is why God's so neat. And, <laughs> and what makes Christianity so unique is that Jesus says, I am the door. And some, someone might say, well, only, only one way? Well, guess what? If God gave us one way, we'd want two ways. If God gave there us ten go. ways, we'd want eleven ways. Why? Because we really want my way. We want my way or the highway. Hmm. God gives us one way, and he gives us a very clear way. And it's through the resurrected Jesus Christ. Excellent. God built the bridge from him to us. A bridge that we literally couldn't build. Every other bridge is a bridge to nowhere. Mm, very good. Okay. Um, again, if there is no resurrection, uh, all preachers and witnesses of the resurrection would be liars. That's kind of self-evident. Mm. There would be no redemption from sin. That one's huge. Oh, my gosh, yeah. No redemption from sin. So we Because who's our Christians. sin? Who's our, who do we sin against? God. Right. That's right. It's, it's it, ultimately against God. Yeah, ultimately against God. Okay. Absolutely. And Jesus claimed to forgive sins against God. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. Um, all former believers would have perished. That goes without mm -hmm. saying. Absolutely. And as would we. Absolutely. And that's why Paul says in here, if the resurrection did not happen, we Christians are to be most of all pitied mm -hmm. because we're living a lie, we're dying a lie, and it's, it's all false. Absolutely. But he's saying that's a hypothetical question because mm -hmm. he did rise. Absolutely. And the physical evidence um, is all right there. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. Lon has a saying, we've heard this, forever here, but maybe you haven't heard it. Follow a dead sa savior, end up just like him. Absolutely. And that's really the, 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 the essence of what we're talking about today. Absolutely. Um, I want to bring this home in, in this sense, um, so what kind of thing. And this is like the, the question, um, okay, Jesus resurrected, um, what's the big deal? You know, Jesus was resurrected, I only got the t-shirt. You know, what, how does that affect me? What does that really mean? It means everything because when we die, um, what, we are to be crucified. We are to be crucified with Jesus, with our Lord. And um, Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life I now live, in the flesh I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That is, that is <coughs> our creed. That is who we are. That was, like I said, Galatians 2, verse 20. Um, favorite author of mine, A.W. Tozer, says it this way. Um, what I mean by the crucified life is a life wholly given over to the Lord in absolute humility and obedience, a sacrifice pleasing to the Lord. The word crucified takes us back to what Christ did on the cross. He also goes on, the crucified life is absolutely committed to following after Jesus Christ, to be more like him, to think like him, to act like him, to love like him. The whole essence of spiritual perfection has everything to do with Jesus Christ, not with rules and regulations, not with how we dress or what we do or do not do. We are not to look like each other. Rather, we are to look like Christ. So this is not a community of people who are just trying to get it right, get ourselves together before we present ourselves. No, no, we, we cannot do it. We absolutely have to be sure of that. But we, when we accept Christ, we die to these things. We can all get caught up in the nuances of religion and miss the glorious joy of following after Christ. Whatever hinders us in our journey must be dealt a death blow. Or hmm. put in other words, whatever hinders us in our spiritual journey must be crucified. That is what we're talking about. Not just the crucifixion, we talked about that last week, but now the resurrection. Because without Christ's resurrection, we are most of all to be pitied. Fools. Um, that pretty much covers it for tonight. Um, I, we will... Uh, close in prayer, and then we will have some questions and answers at the end of that. All right? So, Pete, can I ask you to close us out in prayer? Oh, I'd love to do that. Oh, did you have anything else you want to add? No, uh, we'll just I didn't mean to cut you out. No, no, we'll close out in prayer, and then we'll go to questions, and while we're waiting on questions, um, I will uh, add a couple. Great. Okay. Right, thanks for the time. Hey, everyone, I just want to say thank you uh, for the opportunity to uh, thank teach you, God's Pete. word to you. I, I, I prayed that it was a blessing. And you guys were a blessing to me, and I appreciate it. So and you. Pete will be back again before the series is over, too. Absolutely. So, okay, man. So, well, don't, don't ruin it for him. <laughs> God bless you guys. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for everyone that's there. 
all in the internet, Lord, listening uh, to your gospel message, your promise of resurrection, Lord. And I pray you give them uh, eyes to see, glasses, Lord, to put on, mm. to see things in a new light from your perspective. I love, Lord, that you knew that they would be here. Acts 17, 26, when the Apostle Paul was debating the false philosophies of the day, he said this, from one man, God created every nation of men. He determined the times set for them in the exact places that they should live. God did this so that man would reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. So I pray, Lord, that you would truly do a mighty work and that I would have brothers and sisters in Christ anew. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. I know many of you are in small groups and other, um, you know, are going to leave here and start having your small group time. So the formal part of the class is over. You're dismissed. <laughs> but if you want to stick around for more questions, um, Pete and I will be here for a little bit longer. All righty? Absolutely. So that's great. Um, there is a question actually carried over from last week. Oh, okay. Do you want to tackle it? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Is there a different meaning to the word, quote, with child? because there are a lot of doubts targeting the interpretation of Jesus' birth and Mary's uh, conception of virginity. Okay. So being with child. Oh, I know this come from. Okay, I grew up, uh, I grew up, some of my background a little bit, I grew up Catholic. Okay. And, and from the Catholic perspective, the Catholic Church teaches the idea that Jesus, there was this immaculate uh, conception, not the immaculate reception for you Pittsburgh fans <laughs> out there with Frank. That's all we're talking about. We're talking about immaculate conception. And the idea is that, that Mary, quote, was the mother of God. Uh -huh. Now, think about that phrase. You have someone in the effect who's the mother of the divine substance of Jesus Christ. Hmm. She was certainly the mother of his human nature, but not divine nature. Right. So she that term be. doesn't even make sense. Right. right. So the idea being the only reason, there's not really a different interpretation. There's a different extrapolation. The word hmm. to interpret means to draw out. And what ends up happening, and I remember this for myself, uh, Jamie, when I went to the scriptures, I'm reading, I remember reading about Jesus having brothers and sisters. And I, right. I thought to myself, well, that, that must mean something else. It must mean cousins. It must, well, guess what am I doing at the moment, right? Yeah, you're projecting. I'm you're projecting my beliefs. Right. Absolutely. So I was really on the horns of the dilemma. And I remember actually talking to a priest in Arlington, if you're watching, uh, Father, don't remember last name. But I went and talked to him actually. And I said, hey, um, what do you make of this verse? He said, well, uh, it's his cousins, his extended family. Jesus said that everyone who believes in me, or that's our brothers and sisters. I said, yes, yeah. but the problem is the disciples noticed that his brothers and sisters were at the door. Exactly. They caused Jesus to extrapolate. Right. And he really have a really good answer for that. So the idea with child is trying to get uh, out of this idea with the fact that there was literally, that he, they came together and had actual sex. So there is no uh, different interpretation. It's literally, she was a virgin. Jesus was virgin born because of the seed. The sin nature is passed down through the seed. So right. Jesus had to be, in order to be born sinless, but yet be fully human, a virgin birth. So the idea that she was literally with child, again, another miracle, right? If you're a naturalist, you say, well, there are no virgin births. Mm -hmm. You say, hey, some guys claim it nowadays, but the judge makes them pay anyways. But the idea is, hey, this is why it was a miracle. It was, a, it was literally a virgin birth. So here he is living the perfect life, having a divine 100% God, 100% man, which had then proven when he was on the cross and gave up his own spirit. So he, she had to be virgin born. It had to happen that way in order for Jesus to have a, a, not have a, a sin a nature sin, like right. we have, right? Absolutely. So that's kind of the idea behind it. If I didn't capture that or, or maybe build on that, but well, I always like, like to build on it sometimes. No, that's right. excellent, excellent. If there's a okay. follow-up question on that, sure. just send it on sure. through. There is another one. Um, what is the deal with the people, saints, coming out of tombs in Matthew 27, 52 to 54? Mm. Quote, the, the tombs were open and many bodies of the saints Absolutely. had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. First of all, can you imagine mm. being there and seeing that? I mean, oh there's goodness. no, I mean, the, we just talked about the earthquakes, the, 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 uh, the darkness in the middle of the day, the, the temple rent in two, yeah. the curtain, all this stuff's going on. And now, you know, a little bit later, you're seeing the yeah. tombs are open and the dead bodies of the saints walking around. So here the Bible calls them the first fruits of the resurrection. So yeah. Here you see that these, these saints were the first 
ones who were raised with the dead for Christ. So you see this kind of uh, idea that they started appearing as well. That's the only time you have it mentioned. Right. You don't have um, any details about kind of what they did or what that looked like. But I look at that as a time when Hades was closed. There was two compartments in Hades. Wow, well, you get so, into it. Yeah, okay. so it's really yeah. kind of neat. So you have, here you have, um, you have, um, hellish, so to speak, uh, where the people who didn't believe in God, and you have Abraham's bosom, where that's closed, Jesus came, took it, and off they go mm -hmm. uh, into heaven. So you see some of the resurrected bodies. So that's about all you got. There's not too much you can do without, then I'd be kind of doing my own extrapolation at mm -hmm. that point. But that's about all you get. There's some great studies on it. Yeah. If you're really interested, John MacArthur kind of dives into that a little bit. I remember reading it at one time, and um, I, I just don't have it all, all the details matter. But again, you only go that, so far. But, but that's all that's really talks about that's in the all Bible, about. but it gives us a glimpse of it's Our a resurrection. It's it, a it gives a great glimpse, and it's certainly factual. And, and, and I'm curious about who it is. See, that's the stuff. See, this is where you start wondering, <laughs> right? You start seeing, well, oh my gosh, you said here was a guy sitting on the seat of Moses, and here Moses. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know, I don't know. I just kind of wonder what what the Lord was doing. I don't know. So, yeah, that's yeah. something we have to wait on. We really don't have a, any better we'll, answer than we'll that. Ask him when I see him. You know, I, <laughs> he'll say, "Let's go to the tape." So. Yeah. Uh, w is there external evidence about this happening, I guess they're talking about? Is that it? Um, no. No, I don't think not so. That, not that I've seen. No. Uh, historians absolutely. have talked about it. Because not everything's always written down. Right. Like God would make it <laughs> written down if it was really significant, or you'd have these other historians talking about it. So not that I know. Of. And again, uh, uh, praise the Lord for uh, uh, the early church, you know, saving. And we actually, the early Oops. church invented the first book form. Uh, which is actually another, is right? yeah, it's another neat evidence. It's called a codex. It's actually a neat evidence for the fact that here you got these Jews putting books together. As and, opposed to scrolls as before that. As opposed to scrolls okay. because they all read scrolls. Yeah. So it made you wonder why did they change the form as Jews? They changed the day of worship and they changed the form. Probably because they knew that they were collecting God's word together. Wow. So Apostle Paul's writings were all put together in the same order actually we have in our Bible today. Uh, the order by length is called the Pauline Corpus, and the fourfold, fourfold gospel was passed around as well as these books were put together oh, through the great. people that God revealed his truth to. Remember, Jesus said, hey, your truth, your, your eyes will be open basically after I'm, I'm raised from the dead. So it's kind of neat. That's fantastic. So they actually invented the book, all the early forms of the codex uh, tied right into Christianity. Yeah. Kind of neat. That is very neat. Okay. Um all right, I think that's all the questions we have for tonight. This was a lot of fun, Pete. Uh, no, uh, this was this was great. I, I just uh, I, I uh, uh, praise you guys uh, for giving me an opportunity to teach. And every once in a while, you had my squirrel moment. Squirrel. <laughs> you guys know that movie out there. I sent you laughing. I do want to ask you a question though. Can I leave with a question from the sure, Bible? Sure, sure. It's a question actually. Close us uh, out. That Jesus asked. So can we ask a question? Jesus asked. Jesus said, "I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies." And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Hmm. Do you believe this? Hmm. Hmm. Okay, I've got one last question. Wow. Sorry, I no, hate to. No, that, that, that was a great it. conclusion. It kind of. But here's another one. Why does my Bible say squirrel. Mark 16? A squirrel. Yeah, <laughs> Mark 16:9 wasn't always included. Oh, oh, the reason you probably have an NIV. Type it if you have NIV. NIV with the ribbon bookmark. Um, uh, the reason is is that <laughs> the, you have this book right there that says, hey, these weren't, they aren't in the earliest manuscripts. So the idea is when they're putting uh, all these uh, manuscripts together, it's not in the earliest manuscripts is what it says. So I'm curious what the verse is. Yeah, so. if you go at the end of Mark, you'll see it there. Uh, but oh, that, that's right. It yeah. said, yeah, it, there's a big line that says the most reliable early manuscripts and Absolutely. other witnesses do not have Mark 6, 16, yeah. 9 through 20, that whole part. Absolutely. So what, what's interesting is when you read uh, Mark uh, 16, 9 through 20, is there's nothing new uh, in, in uh, Mark 16 here. This is all covered in Matthew or, 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 or Luke and John as well. Hmm. So it's the earliest manuscripts available. What's interesting, though, is the fact that we have as many manuscripts as we do have. Yeah, because Diocletian it made an edict to destroy all of the scriptures uh, in 303 AD. That is cool. Ain't that kind of cool? So yeah. now we have all these uh, books. He, he he deemed it impossible. Hmm. So kind of neat. So well, yep. Not a great question though. That's a great question. Great so question. I have it right here in mind as well. Yep. Okay. Very good. Listen. Thank you so much. This was fun, and we will see you next week, same time. All right. God bless. Have a good evening.